Knocks it through. Mullen bursting into the box. Josh Mullen. Mullen's ball across. It's turned in. It's Pittman who's got it. Livingston leads. Now can they get the ball back in? O'Brien. The lead. And Livingston have the lead. Man, the score. The full time whistle blows and David Hay celebrates. And the Livingston fans join in exultation. Livingston had the lead against Rangers. And they are certainly rising to a few occasions on their return to the top flight in Scotland. Hello. You are once again listening to Talk Livy, the podcast dedicated to West Lothian's football team, Livingston Football Club, and proudly sponsored by Stjarna Apparel. My name's Ewan, and today I'm joined by Angus. Angus, you, I don't know if you've had a touch of the sun or you're still absolutely raging with Saturday's performance because you you look a different shade of red. (laughs) Yeah, I wish I could come on and pretend that try and be a bit jovial like you have with the wee intro there, but fed up you and honestly, yeah, not good. This is going to be a, an interesting episode, I guess. Yeah, I guess we'll just better get right into it, right? Yeah, well, as always, search for Talk Livy on your preferred podcast streaming site where you can follow or subscribe so you don't miss an episode. You can also catch up on all our episodes that we've done today as well. We'll kick the episode off by discussing our re- recent Scottish Cup exit at Celtic Park, followed up by a terrible showing at Easter Road against Hibs. We'll round up the latest action from our women's side as they exited the Scottish Cup, but did return to winning ways at the weekend in SWPL2. And finally, we'll look ahead to the visit of Celtic to West Lothian after an international break. <sighs> <laughs> The Lions faced a daunting trip to Celtic Park in the Scottish Cup quarter-final. Despite levelling twice in the game, Livy would concede late on to bow out the Scottish Cup. You know, you and going into this game, I think we both kind of went into it thinking that there's going to be absolutely zero hope of us kind of taking anything from there. There was no signs of encouragement from kind of previous weeks or anything like that as to why we go to Celtic Park and do something. And it's in typical kind of fashion that we've went there and probably produced one of our top five performances of the season, right? Absolutely. I think I kind of said it, as long as we went there and showed an intent to win the cup tie and gave a decent account of ourselves, I think regardless of the result, I would have came away fairly happy with it. And I don't think you can dispute that we gave a decent account of ourselves and made it a tricky cup tie for Celtic. I think we did offer a threat. Had an early opportunity, I Obelai hit the post, albeit I think a foul was given in the build-up, which is probably questionable, but regardless. However, we did go behind early doors, Dyson Maeda scoring the goal, and it's kind of one of the last things you want to do when you go to Celtic Park and Ibrox, but we seem to make a habit of it this season, is conceding early doors in these games. It's really, really poor defending from Michael Nottingham at full-back, and to be honest, I think he had a pretty torrid afternoon with Maeda. Maeda probably could have came away with three match balls. All opportunities very similar. It's a ball in from deep by by Kuhn and he's just completely switched off and Maeda's got wrong side of him and, and managed to tuck it away but we responded really well. Dan McKay got the goal. It's a ball over the top. I'll be honest, watching it, I just instantly thought he was offside because he was in that much space. I, I just couldn't believe the Celtic back four had allowed that much space in behind him at that point but it's a really tidy finish by Dan McKay on the half volley and gets us back in the game but the second Celtic goal I mean it's just put it bluntly comical absolutely comical 
first of all, from our own corner, I don't know about you, but the overload that Celtic had on one side, all our players were drawn to the ball. I think that creates the opportunity in the first instance is that massive overload that we allowed. But then we do deal with the situation to an extent. We're in control of it at this point on the edge of our own box. Christian Montano and Stephen Kelly, probably more so Christian, and I'm sure Christian will come up a couple of times in this podcast today for other reasons, but Christian just needs to deal with the ball and it's it's really poor. Michael McGovern, to be honest, I think O'Reilly's shots going wide. There's probably not a reason for him to to make such an effort for that for that effort from the edge of the box. And then Maeda's managed to follow it up and it's it's two one at half time. But you know, we had another couple of scares, and again, Maeda was the one that was on the end of the vast majority of these opportunities, but we did get in at half time just the goal behind and you're still in the cup tie and we were even more in the cup tie after the break after a header Teddy Yengis put wide he then scores a quite sublime goal to be honest it's brilliant by Jamie Brandon in the middle of the park we kind of questioned Jamie coming on in centre mid up at McDermott Park but I think Jamie gave a pretty decent account of himself there my view on Jamie Brandon is he's like the new Jack McMillan He'll play literally anywhere and give you a 7 out of 10. And I think he's one of the rare players this season that would come away with pass marks for me. But he wins the ball, plays in Yenge, and he's still got a lot to do when he gets the ball in that position. But he's come back in on his right side and it's an absolutely sublime finish. And I quite enjoyed the celebration as well, right in front of the Green Brigade. Well played, Teddy. But <laughs> let's be honest, it was always going to be a, a tough, tough ass to try and get into the extra time, penalties, etc. and go and win the game. We did have a good opportunity at 2-2, though Joe Hart's pulled off a good save from Michael Nottingham. But it was a case, I think the goal was coming, that third goal. And again, it's... Once again, Michael Nottingham switched off at the back post. I think... Don't track the run. I think it's a water that gets in behind and puts the ball across. We don't track that run. And then, you know, you're really up against it. I think they hit the bar shortly after that. Again, Maeda on the end of it. And then the the fourth goal is just a case of you've chucked bodies for it in a cup tie. You know, the fourth goal doesn't mean an awful lot to me, but it's it's well tucked away by Kyogo. But it was a very good account of ourselves. Probably, I agree with the manager that it's probably the most we've been in a game at Celtic Park and, and caused them problems. But defensively, some of the goals were you can't defend like that when you go to when you go to Celtic Park. Yeah, it's been a downfall for a lot of things this season, but I think you're just happy to see us um, give a good account of ourselves there. And I think that's all that every fan has asked for um, in abundance of these games this season, that they at least have a go, showcase the talent that we have. And, you know, we've come away with a good couple of goals in that match because of that and, you know, created, you know, a good couple of opportunities as well. Nobody expected anything from it. And, you know, we... Yeah, we gave a good account of ourselves. And I think a lot of people watching that game would have been like, how is this team sitting at the bottom of the league? Well, there's a reason why this team's sitting at the bottom of the league, Ewan, is how we go nicely onto, onto this game here against Hibs. We always kind of talk about Hibs on this podcast as a team you could probably get against and all that. But you know that they have quality. And the issue was on Saturday is that we completely stood off of them and let those kind of quality players walk through our defences and stuff like that. Absolutely shocking, you know, to so see a goal, what, was it three minutes in for the first one? Ball down um, our left-hand side, going to be a, a thing that's going to sound very familiar once I repeat the other goals as well. Ball gets cut back, I think it's a, it's an initial save or it's an initial kind of block and then it's a beat or runs in just to tap into the back of the net. Everything seems as if, you know, we're going in slow motion and we're too afraid to put a foot in or anything like that. And I think that, that just summed up what the rest of the game was going to be compiled by the fact that only a handful of minutes later they go down the exact same side, cut back, player three in the in the box. Is it was it Malida? Fires it into the net to make it two 0 Seven minutes in, and yeah, seven minutes in, you and you're already thinking, oh, should we should we be leaving the game again? It's hilarious to just think about that again. Ten minutes later, we'd be three 0 down again. Another ball coming down the left-hand side of our pitch. No blame Montano, Sean Kelly. Got absolutely no idea who, 
who they thought they were kind of going for. I think there's an instance where Montano is running in the complete opposite direction. The ball kind of goes the other way to Johan, who cuts it back, and suddenly it's 3 0. And, you know, it's an absolute embarrassment of a performance, in all honesty. Conceding three goals in that manner in the opening, what, 17, 18 minutes of a game. Absolutely shocking. And, you know, the players deserve so much grief for that because that was absolutely embarrassing to watch as a supporter. It was, you know, last weekend, in the, the game against Celtic, there was poor goals conceded due to poor defending and all that. I think the big difference you would say, Ewan, is it actually seemed as if at Celtic Park the players were trying. And at Easter Road, it absolutely did not seem as if they were. We're the first people to probably support and back the team in that kind of way. But that's absolutely criminal. Yeah, the the performance, I'm not going to excuse it. I think a couple of things to probably take into account are the fact that the, the stadium was closed down during the week due to a sickness bug. Now, I'm not using it as an excuse whatsoever, but do we know how fit some of these guys were? Or That's a question to be asked, okay? But for me, it still doesn't excuse the the level of performance and how lacklustre a performance it was. I heard the manager come out and say a couple of the players are, it's it's Ramadan. Well, one of the Hibs goal scorers is currently in Ramadan. So <laughs> for me, for me, you can't use that as an excuse either. I know it's probably difficult for these players in that situation, but I'm sure they've managed it throughout their careers as well. But it was just... The tempo that we played at, Hibs are going to play in a testimonial over the international break against Wraith Rovers, and I bet there's a higher tempo in that game than Hibs had to play at in order to cut through us, walk through us. It looked like the Harlem Globetrotters doing an exhibition at the Hydro. That that was the sort of... It, it genuinely, we made Hibs... Don't get me wrong, Hibs have got good players. Right? Eli Yuan's a good player. Marcondes is a good player. Melida is a good player. But see, when you allow these players the amount of time we were giving them on the ball, they're, they're going to look like world beaters. We made Joe Newell look like Iniesta at the weekend with some of the passes we allowed them to go and spray across the park because nobody got near him, especially in that first half. Nobody got near him. The first goal, it's so, so passive. So passive. A beaters just waltzed in from the left-hand side and picked the ball up and I think... One, Kelly doesn't follow the run of Lafondra in the first instance, and then I obelize reaction to trying to stop a beat as well. I just think really looks half arsed, if I'm honest. The goal from Melida, Montano's drawn to the ball, and the initial instance on the left hand side, neither Stephen Bradley or Jason Holt pick up Melida in the box. I think Bradley's with him initially. I don't know if he's tried to pass him on, but neither player reacts or picks him up and he's got a tap in in the centre of the 18-yard box. And then the third goal from Lafondra, I think, is uh, probably the the worst of the bunch. What Montano's doing out in the left-hand side, I, I genuinely have no idea what he's doing. He looks like he's trying to go short when the only threat is in behind. I don't know why he's trying to go short, but Sean Kelly doesn't react to it either behind him. And then it's a, a ball across and Lafondra's got to tap him. Lafondra could add a second if it wasn't for a save from Shamal George in the in the first half. But it was just so lacklustre, so such a half arsed performance it looked like. At half time we make changes, we go to our back three. Well, but before before you go to that, no, Ian, before we get to that, there's a substitution yeah, in the first substitution half. Substitution at half an hour. And as we've mentioned there, three goals have came down that left-hand side. Joel Nubley, Christian Montano, Sean Kelly. Who gets huckled off? And I think that this is something that I actually think is a bit... Well, I think it's really shit. And I think shows poor management from the coaches. It's easy in that instance to go and take off somebody who's, you know, maybe a bit of a quiet or kind of personal of that. As we've mentioned, three goals down that left-hand side where we've just been absolutely walked through. Sure, you can make arguments that, you know, runs have came from the other side for them to tap it in. But at the end of the day, you don't get those goals by those players doing their jobs um, and covering that space and defending properly. Instead of taking one of them off, he takes off Stephen Bradley. And I think that is horrendous man management there. 
If you're trying to send a jolt up the squad, take off one of those senior players who has been actively involved in the conceding of those three goals. I think it's... No, I don't think Stephen Bradley was having a good game. Nobody was having a good game. But I think what that represents is just... It's a nonsensical substitution, in my opinion. You've taken off somebody who's not had nearly the same impact on the game as, you know, three people on that other side. And it's... For me, I um, couldn't believe watching that, that that was the thing that happened there. It's easy to make an example of somebody like that who, you know, young laddie, you know, tough game of game and all of that. You've got three experienced players there who have not shown up. One of them, we've tried to defend and everything like that all this time, isn't up for it. One of them, I believe, has never been personally good enough for this level. And then one who's 1,000% injured. It's... <laughs> And this, this is the first time that we'll probably be speaking about players like this, Ewan, but it's got to that level where, you know, what's the point in us coming on here and trying to defend everything and all of that? We've been overly lenient over the years for, you know, performances and stuff like that because we've we've genuinely seen, you know, the application and stuff like that. But, you know, if players are going to down tools and stuff like that in this manner whilst we're still paying money to go to it, then screw it, right? Yeah, just kind of my thoughts on that substitution is when you saw Sangari, and I think it was Devlin as well, was out warming up in the first half, we called it, we went, well, it's either going to be Bradley or Stephen Kelly that he's going to use as the scapegoat here. And it was exactly that. Stephen Bradley came off. And I really feel for Stephen because I don't think he's had a major contribution in terms of the position that we're in this season. You know, he's he struggled a wee bit with injuries and things like that. And I think he's a player that if he would had been fit, I would have loved to have seen in the side a lot more often than he's been able to be this year. But as I say, I think it was a an easy out as a option as a scapegoat there. Going on to the changes in the second half. I mean, this we talked about it at St St. Johnston as well, the, the thought process and the substitutions. We went to a back five. And you've got the back five with Devil, Nobleye and Kelly there. Now, the three players, you had Christian Montano, Jamie Brandon and Mo Sangari. Okay? So you've got a left back slash wing back there in Christian Montano. You've got a right back slash right wing back there in Jamie Brandon. And you've got a centre mid in Mo Sangari. We end up with Mo Sangari as the left wing back, Jamie Brandon as the centre mid, and Christian Montano as the right wing back. Why? You've got three players there who can play in their natural position, and somehow you've managed to put all three of them out of position. It's so overly complicated, there's no need for it. There's absolutely no need for it. I don't know how tactical, how much he was thinking about it, but there's no need to be doing that. Absolutely no need. And again, just upsets the entire balance of our team for the sake of trying to combat Hibs at that point. Tell you what, see if Hibs wanted to at the weekend, they could have easily repeated that 7-0 from 2006 if they put their foot on the gas and went through the gears. They could have absolutely comfortably hit us for seven. And there's an element of me that wishes they did just to highlight the issues, the clear, clear issues that are going through this team. I was I was speaking to somebody, a uh, Hibs fan at my uni, and he said, "Oh, like at least you were like a little bit better, like in the in the second half." And I was like, "Is it that we were better, or is it that you completely kind of took your foot off the gas a little bit and realised you that you've had the game won in twenty minutes?" And he was like, "Yeah, that's prob that's probably it." <laughs> yeah, and it, exactly, and it's easy to go and play it three 0 down. There's no pressure on you at that point. It's easy to go and play it three 0 down. And second half was a very kind of non-contest affair. There wasn't very much to report from it. Sangari had an opportunity which Wallacott's made a save from. But as I say, Hibs were just going through the motions at this point. They didn't have to do anything in the game. But tell you what, if they did, as I say, they would have repeated that 7-0 under Paul Lambert from 2006 quite comfortably, I feel, if they decided to go through the gears because we just weren't up for it or interested in that game, in my opinion. And... I've repeatedly kind of gone on record. I don't think the players have down tools. I would say that's the first time I've looked at that team and think that they're not playing for the manager. And I think it's very difficult to come to a different conclusion if you look at that first half performance in particular. It's very, very difficult. And we'll probably might as well go on to talk about the the incident at the end of the game as well. 
I happen to know the individual very well, as listeners of this podcast will probably know very well that <laughs> was involved in the incident, a certain Mr. Andrew Semple. But I think it just kind of highlights everything that's going wrong at this moment in time. Obviously, Christian's come over to applaud the fans. I think the terms used were fuck off, shite bag. I think were the terms used. Christian's obviously reacted to that, came over. And he was basically asked, do you think that performance is acceptable? And then obviously a couple of his teammates, Jamie Brandon, Mikey Devlin, have come across and and ushered them away. Mikey Devlin just made a gesture as to say, we get it. And I need to be consistent here with what I've said, because I spoke about it last year when Nicky Devlin was getting a bit of, a bit of stick from our fans. I do not agree with the players getting abuse or anything like that from the stands. It's not my cup of tea. Do I get it? I do get frustration as a fan. You pay a lot of money to go and follow the team and when you are subjected to a performance like that, it is a natural reaction as much as I don't agree with it. But there also comes a degree where you can look at Christian and you can say, is his reaction because he just cares? But there's an element where maybe it's not the time and place to have that reaction off the back of a performance like that. It's very difficult to defend your performance. But... Professional footballers know when they've not had a good game. Trust me, they know when they've not had a good game. They're their own worst critics. So they don't need berated and, and told that, essentially. But I can absolutely understand a fan's frustration because I'm as frustrated as the next fan in terms of the performances that we're being subjected to at this moment in time. And over the last over the last 12 months in general, the, the level of performance that we've been subjected to. But as I say, I, I don't agree with abusing individual players but I, I can get it to a degree as I say I need to be consistent in what I've said before and as much as Andy's a, a good friend of mine he had a bit of a heat loss moment let's put it put it that way yeah I was in the pub at this time you so, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, about about what, 35 minutes prior to this uh, I was in the, in the, in the mash ton but now nah, like I do I do have similar kind of thoughts to you there the frustrations and everything like that that we have don't think quite go to like personally kind of abusing players and stuff like that yeah maybe it can be channeled in like a, in like a different kind of way but at the same time you can completely understand why you know following the team up and down the country performances have been appalling for you know the best part of a year now are we too nice like People might say that about us on this podcast unit as well, where, you know, giving them, giving them the benefit of the doubt and stuff like that. Is there an element of, you know, it's a bit too comfortable? It's, it doesn't matter to these players and stuff like that? I think obviously we know about players, you know, contracts coming up at the end of the season and stuff as well. It all just piles into one cauldron of just, just negativity and... The thing that we just need the most now is just for the season to end in all honesty and we can have a fresh start in the championship. And in terms of how fresh start goes, Ewan, I guess we'll need to see wholesale changes needed because, as you kind of mentioned there as well, this team's better than what they're showing. And the performances mean one or two things, Ewan. It means that the players in the team are absolutely guff or that they don't want to play for the manager. I guess people will have their opinions on what one it is, but that that's shown on Saturday there. The players do need to take a huge amount of responsibility for that as well, for that 20 minutes of just sheer lack of application. And, you know, if they're not wanting to play for the manager, well, they're, they're no good to us right now, in all honesty. Well, a lot of them won't be playing for the manager regardless if he's there next season or not because there's a lot of them who are out of contract and... Let's be honest, we're going to the championship. I'm, I'm assuming a lot of these guys aren't going to hang about. They'll think that they're better than that. You kind of talk about the manager. There's a bit's come out that he was over in Switzerland doing part of his pro licence during the week. Again, a, a lot of fans would be very, very critical of that. I don't know what the timescales are in terms of doing your pro licence. It might have been obligatory that he had to go across and do that. But the picture it paints when you're in the position we are in and your manager's no in the building during the week, it doesn't look it doesn't have a good look about it, does it? Nah, not really. 
but I do have the sympathy and I guess like there may be certain things that managers have to do and that they might be out of their control but the timing of it is all what's you know not great about it and what I would say about you know regarding the manager as well is uh, the knock-on effect that this might have in terms of the kind of like future seasons especially when it comes to like recruitment and stuff like that if these players of all kind of like down tools and stuff like that word spreads within football and stuff like that you know we've done quite well recruiting certain players from other teams because you know word of mouth I've said x y and z about Livingston we've managed to pick up some you know decent players from down south we were able to get like like John Guthrie up the road and stuff like that Jack Fitzwater just from that connection like through like Nicky Devlin like at Walsall and stuff like that which kind of like that kind of networking within football can go a long way I think we'll be concerned at this moment in time that we're going to go into the championship next season and we're going to really struggle to kind of attract players to the club because they've seen what's happened to a whole bunch of players prime examples Bruce Anderson you and people are probably fed up of people like saying this and all that um, but there's a player that first season who was destined to go on to like bigger bigger things next two seasons after it we've absolutely squandered you know, the possibilities and all of that. And it only seems to be down to the fact that, you know, the manager doesn't fancy him and stuff like that. I'm got a concern that, you know, players of that kind of ilk and that aren't going to look at Livingston anymore and be like, that's a team that I want to play for. That's a manager I want to play for. We used to be good for giving, you know, players opportunities, a platform to like showcase their talents on and that. I think that there's now a negativity towards that and that we're not going to be able to be that team who offers that thing now. I've got two two opinions on the manager and, you know, as much as he's in a difficult position just now, I'll, I'll fully back David Martindale until the day he's no longer at Livingston FC. That's just my approach to it. But there's two, there's kind of two strands to it. I think he's lost the dressing room. Looking at that performance at the weekend, I think he's lost the dressing room in my personal opinion. I've always said he has enough credit in the bank that if we went down, he'd get a season in the championship if he so wishes it. I'd kind of still go along those lines, albeit I kind of, I always thought if we did get relegated, we'd be going down kicking and screaming and clawing till the very last breath of the season. And that's obviously not going to be the case this year. We're 10 points adrift at this point in time and it's it's a matter of when. You can look at going down to the championship. He's going to get the opportunity of essentially a complete rebuild of the squad. Does the manager have it in him to do that rebuild at that level and have a degree of success in the championship, given our kind of style, given how his teams have typically set up over the years? Quite possibly. It might be a, an area that he thrives in and excels in in the championship where we have had success under his recruitment before. But there's also an element, do you think it just needs completely fresh eyes at the the situation? A a complete freshen up from top to bottom? I think there's also plenty of argument for that as well. There's kind of two, as I say, two strands to that thought process. And I think... You know, I was having a bit of debate on Twitter on Saturday night and you can't look past six league wins in 44. There's no other manager in football that survives that. And the fans need some questions answered and be that from higher up to John Ward and Dave Black. I think fans have so many questions, both with the ownership and the running of the football club You know, there's comments that have been made on social media with regards to John Ward. John's made a comment saying, you know, if Davy leaves, I leave. In my opinion, that's kind of questionable as to where the loyalty lies. Is it with the manager? Is it with the football club? You know, I think these questions need to be asked and and answered because you need to bear in mind, a lot of fans are shareholders in this football club after that COVID season where they put their hand in their pocket and put money into the club to help them keep running over that season where there was no fans in the stadium. And those that money was converted into shares. So we're not just paying customers, we're actually shareholders of this football club. And I think these questions need to be asked and there needs to be an outlet for it. The trust has come out with some very bizarre 
posts in recent weeks. They're talking about how they can't hold their AGM at the stadium because a member is banned from the stadium. Is this a Rankin or a Hogarth that is a member of this and is still involved with the trust? You know, it's there's so many questions I think fans have, and it's not just related to what's happening on the park, but they need yeah, answers. Something, yeah, something needs to be outlined. Number one, the future of the playing kind of style and everything like that. You know, what's the plan there? Two, yeah, all that nonsense in the background. Something needs to be cleared up with that as soon as possible. And, yeah, I don't know what is going on with that, if legality, legal issues and stuff like that are the things that are kind of clawing it back, but it's really not helping. And as you're saying, you know, it doesn't seem as if we're going to get any answers from anything. Everything's so vague. There's not really anything much coming about it. And it's like, it's just one bad thing after another. And that's what the frustrating side of it is, because we know the people at the club and that who are working ever like so hard and all of that, who are kind of getting bogged down with this kind of negativity as well. And it's just an unfortunate thing that's happening right now. It's just everything's just compiling onto one another, and it's going to it's going to end up turning nasty for sure. It's boiled up for too long, and there's no resolution in sight. It's going it's going to kind of explode over at one point. I would imagine. Yeah, and to be very clear, like I I know John personally. I know Dave personally. I've said it on countless platforms and national media as well as multiple podcasts how much time I have for the manager as well I don't want it to turn sour for these guys because I know John has the club's best interests at heart I know Dave certainly has the club's best interests at heart and I'm sure the manager does as well given what the football club's done from I don't want it to turn sour for these guys but the way things are going it is turning sour and naturally when things aren't going well at a football club who do folk look to for answers it's your board, it's your chairman it's your CEO and that's naturally what's happening right now folk are looking to them for answers as to what's going on and I think it's absolutely within fans rights to be asking these questions and looking for a bit of clarity as to what's going on at the football club because look we've had our issues in the past let's, <laughs> let's not beat around it and we don't want another episode of this coming along. Well, another um, another thing to add to that as well, you and so today's came out about how Tony Macaroni aren't going to be sponsoring the stadium and stuff like it's that. It's probably the worst news of the season, to be <laughs> honest with you. <laughs> but even you even like look at that aspect as well. Like, so how long they've been in, was it nine years or something like that, I believe. Last season as well was the the last time that Phoenix Rillin were putting money into the club, who seemed to be quite content and supporting the club in that kind of way as well. So we've kind of lost, you know, two of our main sponsors in the last year, essentially. Is that something to be concerned about? Is there stuff revolving that as well? Who knows? I guess when you're in this kind of moment, you start speculating kind of everything that starts happening at the club. And, you know, as you're mentioning about money and administrations and stuff like that in the past, I think we're right to be, you know, concerned. (laughs) <laughs> that's that's why I think there needs to be a platform I know John Ward has apparently reached out to the Trust about coming and appearing at a AGM apparently he wasn't actually invited I invite you to go and read some of the Trust posts on Facebook in particular it's kind of bizarre and very sceptic reading I'll be honest with you but you know John's offered to go and appear at that and try and answer some questions I think there just needs to be a platform. Maybe maybe we can be the initiators of that, Angus. Maybe we invite John or we invite Dave onto the podcast and and just put some of these questions or uh, get fans' questions to to these guys. Maybe that's an option, but it's certainly something we can look at together. But yeah, it's it's not rosy at the football club and I think the international break is probably a bit of a blessing for most Livingston fans at this moment in time. That was fun. <laughs> We're delighted to have Strana Apparel as sponsors of Talk Livy, UK based with a Swedish soul. We are Strana. Strana is an independent fashion brand from Scotland who create high quality and stylish attire for on and off the terraces. 
Inspired by terrace culture, lifestyle and music, all their clothing is designed using quality materials and workmanship to combine the very best style and fit. And all of this means you get a premium quality fashion at affordable prices while enjoying a simple and secure service. As a bonus for Top Livy listeners, you can get 10% off your order using the code TOPLIVY at the checkout. We'll also have some exclusive giveaways during the season, so keep your eyes peeled on our socials for those too. And thanks to Starner for sponsoring Top Livy. The Lionesses have been in action of late, starting with their Scottish Cup quarter final with Spartans. Quality would show as the SWPL one side ran out with a 5 0 victory in West Lothian. Angus, I think it, we kind of talked about it, it was always going to be a tough ask given there is that little bit of a gap probably between SWPL one and two, but it was a comfortable victory for, for Spartans, wasn't it? Yeah, definitely. So um, that quality in the attacking third definitely was the was a big change for it. Um, we could not deal with essentially their kind of their wind their wide play. Um, their wingers gave us an absolute torrid time the whole match, um, and we couldn't kind of cope with that. I don't think that you know necessarily technically on the ball Spartans were you know so, so far ahead of us. There were a good couple of times where you put pressure onto them and you were winning the ball back in decent areas. I think the big difference came from that kind of athleticism and, you know, having those players in the final third who could punish you at no matter what. Um, Lassie Maya Bates who on the left wing, I think she's just been called up for the Scotland under-19s. She was probably player of the match by country mile because every time she got the ball, she was direct and caused problems for her pace and, you know, putting terrific balls into the box and stuff like that. I think she got at least two assists uh, for the lassie uh, who got, I think Galbraith got a hat-trick. And yeah, it was a, it was a tough afternoon. We didn't really kind of create much ourselves. We were kind of pegged back quite a lot and, you know, yeah, really, really did struggle with that kind of pace and the, on the break and that. But, you know, it's a kind of learning experience, I guess. That's what you, you, you come up against those kind of teams. You can expect a, a step up and unfortunately on this occasion, we maybe didn't give the best kind of account of ourselves, but, you know, tough afternoon. You know, I think should be proud of the achievement of getting to the, the Scottish Cup quarterfinals as it is. Yeah, and it's kind of, it's an opportunity to see where they would want to be, isn't it? When you're playing up against the established side at the top level of Scottish women's football. So it it's that kind of example. I, I was speaking to the girls at the, the weekend there. Obviously, I'm involved at Spartans and I, I work with a few of the girls that, that play with the women's side and, Robin McCaffrey who plays at centre half was having a, a good laugh at some Livy Ultras who were singing if you hate the fucking Spartans clap your hands for almost 90 minutes solid and I think Robin <laughs> actually said at one point she kind of joined in when the ball was out of play <laughs> but at least there's some folks trying to create an atmosphere at these games yeah um, you do not agree by kind that of, kind yeah, of a serial uh, thing like yeah, to kind of be hearing at these kind of matches and stuff like that but I guess it's the only thing is is that if they've taken that away from the game rather than kind of anything else, then I guess it maybe shows that more work kind of needs to be done, um, you know, to kind of reach that kind of level for sure. But no, as you said, you know, can kind of aspire to that. There's still a team that's only, you know, what, three seasons into our existence and stuff, you know, that's, you know, Spartans are quite an established side within the women's game in Scotland. So, you know, no, there's no real kind of shame um, in that kind of showing I think, to be fair, a lot of people probably would have expected the kind of outcome that did ensue. But yeah, it's it'd been kind of a. It would be maybe been interesting if the cup tide came, you know, maybe a couple of months before when we'd been a little bit more higher on confidence and stuff like that, and you know, playing a little bit better. But yeah, no qualms about the game, and you know, Spartans fully deserved it. And you know, I'm quite glad to see that the Scottish Cup draws put them and Hearts together. So at least one of them is going to make the final now as well. So um, as opposed to, you know, the finals usually being dominated by, you know, the old firm and, you know, the Glasgow City teams. So, yeah, all the best to them and hopefully they can go on. I guess uh, once you get put out by a team, you're like, oh, well, you may as well be put out by the winners unless it is by one of the old firm, to be fair. Obviously, again, with my involvement at Spartans, it was a it's a great cup draw for the, for the girls. It gives them a right good opportunity at, at reaching the Scottish Cup final, which would be fantastic for 
a football club that's very close to my heart. So, kind of moving on. I to... said that. I hope he gets pumped. <laughs> Uh, but moving on to the next game, it was followed up by a pretty another very tough game for the girls on the roads against Queen's Park, who are current runaway league leaders in SWPL two, and it would be a another heavy defeat for the girls, ending four 0 What was your kind of thoughts on the game? It's quite an interesting one though, yeah, because like see, like the first like twenty minutes or so, it was actually quite even. We were actually playing some nice kind of stuff. I think that we couple of injuries and you know a couple of other players like leaving the club and stuff like that we were forced into kind of you know tweaking the formation a little bit we ended up with with it being like Lauren Evans up top with Jen Hannah Davey and Anna Dickoff playing off of her and I actually do quite like that forward four they're all players who want to play kind of football like what's deemed the right way they want to get the ball down keep it and all of that none of them are necessarily the quickest or maybe necessarily the strongest players to be playing balls over the top and, you know, be kind of playing in that kind of style. So to actually see us revert to a bit where, you know, we're keeping possession, we're, you know, protecting the ball well, we're working it into their final third is actually something that has been missing for quite a long time. And I think that it's a, it's a style of play that suits our team a lot, lot better. Nonetheless, Queen's Park were threatening were were threatening by that long ball over the top and we could not seem to cope with it. They got their breakthrough from that and then there's a very slack goal lost for the second one to make it 2-0 in the space of two minutes. And I think that that second goal kind of knocks the stuffing out of you. We kind of had a good start against the, the team who were about 13 points clear at the top of the league um, away from home. And yeah, I think from that kind of moment, you just kind of see like maybe like the confidence was knocked out of us a little bit. I would say that that first 20 minutes definitely did have some signs of encouragement, but yeah, Queen's Park sort of just came thoroughly into it themselves and were starting to threaten at most kind of opportunities. And, and it seems to be something that we're maybe, maybe struggling a little bit with is, you know, dealing with when a team goes on that kind of direct approach when the ball goes over um, and they have, you know, pace. You know, I think that there's the two strikers for Queen's Park were dragging Jess and Tash just as far as they could. They also had a wee number 10 who was taking advantage of that every time and, you know, getting ahead of our defensive midfielders and running, you know, 15 yards beyond them. Um, she ended up notching the third goal as well. But again, I think we're, we're going there with, you know, like we had three subs and a goalkeeper as well. So we're quite short, short-handed. We ended up finishing the game with 10 players as well. But yeah, when we go to talk about the Sterling game, um, some of those things that were, were positive or midweek would, would show up again. One thing I would say as well, Ewan, this game midweek on Wednesday away from Glasgow didn't kick off until 20 past eight. There was like four injuries as well. One, I believe, that the Queen's Park players had to go to hospital for you know a collarbone injury, which we hope that she um, recovers from very quickly. The game didn't finish until like 20 past 10 at night. Absolutely brutal. Yeah, it's, it's one of those. It's a bit like, mind our game with St Johnston the other week, you know, the amount of stoppages and injuries in the game. And you were, I was generally concerned I was going to miss my flight to Budapest the following day. <laughs> like, <laughs> like the game was dragging on that long. But bear in mind, a lot of these girls will have day jobs and, and things like that as well. So it's, yeah, it's a bit of a bit of a farce how, how late the game was kicking off and obviously the incidents in the game that it dragged on. But the weekend there, it did see probably a rare positive to talk about on this week's podcast. But the girls did return to winning ways with a hard-fought win against Stirling Uni. And you mentioned Hannah Davy there. Hannah Davy got the winner, I believe. It's good to see her back in, involved because she has been out injured for kind of a prolonged period. And I think on paper when she signed, looked a very promising sign and having played age group level for Scotland and things like that in the past. Yeah, definitely. So um, I think I remember one of the first kind of pre-season games um, away to East Fife and I was like, this player looks absolutely incredible. I don't think it's quite worked so far this season. I'm not sure if it's been like the physicality or, you know, as injuries have like kind of came up as well, we've not been able to get the kind of best out of Hannah and stuff like that. But again, as I kind of mentioned with that Queen's Park game, you know, putting those kind of players around her who are also players who want to kind of keep the ball I think that that's the thing that's going to get the best out of this team is that we play football in the way that suits most of our talents. 
the likes of Hannah, the likes of Jen, Anna Dickov, you know, those kind of players who are ball players essentially. They want to get the ball down, they want to make, you know, short little passes. They're not going to knock the ball ten yards in front of a defender and run onto it. They're not going to want, you know, balls over the top that they're going to like run on into the final third and stuff like that. It's just not their game. But I think if we recognise that that's the kind of like the attributes that our team have, that's the best way to kind of go forward. Because some of the, actually, the biggest compliment I could probably give the women's team on uh, that first half on uh, Sunday was that I just really, really enjoyed watching them play. Just some of the stuff, like the way they were knocking about, it was just, yeah, it was controlling. They kept the ball very well. They were recycling it. They were making the right decisions at the right times and stuff like that. We've often fell into a trap this season at times where it's like, right, we need to get into that final third like as soon as possible. But on Sunday, it definitely seemed to be, you know, a kind of different performance. I think the likes of, you know, Lauren Evans up top, I think that she had a really, really good game on Sunday as well. And her kind of experience, kind of talking the team through the game, if you like, if you were to watch her, you would you'd hear her the whole time giving out instructions, telling people where to go and stuff like that. Um, encouraging people to come closer when she's holding the ball up and stuff like that. And I think that, you know, again, she's another player who this kind of, if we kind of progress on that way, we'll continue to get the best out of, uh, which will be a massive boost for the team because I believe that she has, you know, top level experience as well and does seem to have, you know, a good knack on the ball and stuff like that. Bryony Ross, I thought, had our best game for the club as well. I thought she was, again, very, very talkative at the back, her alongside Jess at centre half. And I think it's funny that, She's played centre half for the first, well, in the back two, in the back, well, the two centre halves in the back four for the first time this season. And that's where she gets a goal, where she's kind of been playing, you know, on that left hand side where she's had a bit more freedom to go up and um, takes a, a very good goal from the edge of the box. Don't know if it's possibly a cross or not, but, you know, again. We'll, we'll give her the benefit of the doubt she makes. Exactly. It. Aye. Uh, Herself, Jess, Tash, you know, at the back, you felt very kind of comfortable. We had Beth at left back as well, who. I don't think uh, it's necessarily the most keen being uh, a very attacking player at having to do some defensive responsibilities, but gave a committed shift and, you know, that's all you can kind of ask from the players. Matt. So, Barely yeah. player of the match because we sponsored it as well. That's... Yeah, I, well, I said that to her on a, on Wednesday. I was like, when you come on, you, you've got to get a hat trick. And she was like, why? And I was like, well, because we sponsor you, obviously. <laughs> it didn't seem to give her the motivation that I was hoping for, <laughs> uh, sadly, but Sterling would get a goal back, you know, in the second half, but I don't think that they necessarily did enough in the game to kind of merit anything else. So um, a pleasing performance they've kind of seen and, you know, makes a, a swift change from what we've been putting up for, for the men's team for quite a while now. Yeah, as you say, it's been a kind of, minus the result against Kilmarnock and obviously progressing Scottish Cup league-wise, it's been not the thing. best form of late since the winter break, hasn't it? But it is a result that, you know, it takes us four points clear of Borough Muir in the league, albeit still kind of trailing Kilmarnock by, by seven points, albeit they dropped points, I believe, during the week. They suffered quite a heavy defeat to Gart Cairn, which was probably a little bit of a turn-up for the books, but it's going, to, it's going to be difficult to close that gap, isn't it, at seven points just now? Oh, yeah, definitely. And I think that you look at the squad right now as well, Jen came off with quite a nasty ankle injury. Shannon Mulligan got some sort of crater on her head from heading the back of Eve Somerville on, on Sunday as well. So I don't think that she'll be out for too long, but again, had to come off as just kind of a precaution. We're missing Courtney McAvoy and Sharon Hughes, uh, Hughes Lee from uh, from the game midweek due to injury and that as well. We've also lost, you know, like Fiona Walker's moved on, you know, who'd like to thank for, you know, so many kind of good years of service and stuff like that at the club as well. I think that those kind of things are making it a little bit more difficult to handle. That led to three of the youth players kind of coming up into the squad for the first time, which was a, a good thing to see though as well. I think just kind of for the rest of the season, we've just got to kind of look at getting back to kind of enjoying playing football and playing football the right way and stuff like that, I would say. I think that, you know, if I was a player who was playing, especially in that first half on Sunday, I would have enjoyed that kind of way that they were playing and stuff like that. And I hope that that's something that they can maybe take on into the next kind of weeks and that whenever they kind of come up against some of the, the teams higher in the league and all that, don't shy away from that. Don't kind of get drawn into playing the game that kind of way because, like, for example, like Queen's Park are good at those quick current transitions and, you know, putting balls over the top. 
don't get drawn into kind of playing that game just because it's successful for them and thinking, oh, it might work for us as well. Focus on our kind of strengths and all of that. And I think that that's kind of got to be the aim for, for the rest of the season as well. There was another injury on a Sunday for a Sterling Uni player who had to be stretchered off and taken to kind of hospital as well. So again, I think we'll offer our best wishes there as well and hope that it's nothing too too serious as the players seem to be in great discomfort and stuff like that. So hopefully it's not something that is out for too long. But yeah, it seems as if there's a little injury bug around the, our games for both our oppositions and ourselves right now. And hopefully that's something that you know, it's a it's a wee break for us now as well. We can get some players back uh, to full fitness once we get a uh, return to league action. Next up, after the international break. Livingston will welcome Celtic back to the Tony Macaroni Arena for the last time under that name, under the Sky Sports cameras as well. Ewan, you know, we we started the episode off by talking about, you know, how we gave such a good account of ourselves. I think we're um, so far away from that again, though, aren't we? Celtic are coming into a little bit of form, a good one at the weekend. We produced maybe one of our worst performances of the season. Still fancy us, though, right? Oh yeah, I fancy a comfortable three 0 victory for Celtic. No, <laughs> no, it's oh god, it's difficult to motivate, isn't it? It's really, really <laughs> difficult to motivate for this one. Yeah, in front of the sky cameras, Celtic. You know, we got a we got a lot of joy against them, but it's a very different type of game, isn't it? A cup tie, a one off cup tie. You can probably afford to be a little bit more expansive and a little bit more threatening in terms of it because, you know, it's a one-off one off game. With this being a league encounter, it'll probably kind of fall into the, the typical format of Celtic will dominate the ball, we'll sit behind the ball and try at best to offer a threat on the counter-attack. But, yeah, Celtic have obviously got a lot still to play for this season. Obviously, very much neck and neck. They went back to the top of the league given Rangers' postponement. Uh, against Dundee at the weekend so they're back at the top of the league and they'll look to try and put as much pressure on Rangers as possible and and maintain that I think Celtic aren't quite as as much as they're still a difficult team to play against I don't think they've had that same fear factor under Rodgers this season and I think that's that's shown in particular probably at Celtic Park where teams have picked up points there and offered a little bit more of a threat ourselves included in that cup tie However, big plus point for them is Carter Vickers was back at the weekend. We were up against Liam Scales and Stephen Welsh, and I think had that been a centre half pairing going into this game, I think you would have fancied at least maybe causing them a few problems. But I think Carter Vickers is very, very important. He's been very much in and out of side this year through injury, so he'll be a big plus point for Celtic. But yeah, I mean they've just got an absolute abundance of players who can hurt you and I, th- I find it very difficult to imagine how we stop that uh, to be totally honest with you Angus and I think we're in for a very tough afternoon and if the comments I made on the previous segment with Hibs and that our players have down tools if that's the performance we got against no disrespect against Hibs it gives me a, a bit of fear and uh, trepidation as to what Celtic could do to us in a couple of weeks time I think as well how bad we've been, we've probably still avoided being like absolutely thumped by a team. And it probably should have happened on Sunday there where a team took five, six, seven off of us. So any other kind of games that we have, like <laughs> like this, just gives me the fear of that. It honestly is giving me vibes of, remember when Celtic played Dundee United? Yeah. Was it, last season was it? Yeah, last season under Jack Ross, wasn't it? Jack Ross's last game. And I'm really, really struggling to kind of get those fears out of my head right now. There's really, really not much to say. And it's funny because we'd, we'd probably come into this union and we'd talk about, you know, who we'd like to see playing and stuff like that. I've honestly got no idea. Like, <laughs> especially in terms of defence, I'm like, what am I confident of right now? 
I don't know. It's it's such like a kind of weird kind of way where you can understand getting beat by a team being better and stuff like that. But as you said, if we've talked about players kind of down in tools, they don't want to play for the manager whatsoever or whatever like that. Like there's no point in us speculating on who's going to play and stuff like that then. Because at the end of the day, is it going to make any difference? Yeah, exactly. I mean, you talk about the defence in particular, probably the one player that's fit or been playing as of late that I have any sort of trust in is probably Jamie Brandon. He's about the only one I have faith in and what he'll do when he goes onto the pitch. The others, uh, no disrespect, but I don't think they've gained a lot of trust from the fans over the course of the last few months in terms of some of the goals we've been conceding. Further up the pitch, I think it's probably just a a case of whether we play a three at the back and try and get bodies behind the ball or if we do stick with Kenny playing a 4-2-3-1. I can imagine Teddy Yenge will play up top given he caused Celtic a few problems at Celtic Park in the in the recent game. Again, it kind of depends how we want to set up if we're going to offer him a bit of support in the wide areas. Dan Mackay, I'm sure, will probably return to the side. He wasn't available through... Uh, for the Hibs game just because Hibs is his parent club so I would imagine Dan will probably feature again and I think gives you a decent out ball, a decent outlet in terms of if you're looking to break and running behind so I would like to see Dan back in the side but yeah it's it's very difficult to, to kind of predict what we're going to do I imagine Andrew Shinney will probably play in the game as well typically does come in for these sort of games where we're going to have a lot less of the ball just for his experience. So if he's available, I could imagine he would come back into the side and it would be Carson and Holt kind of sitting in behind him. So, as I say, it's very, very difficult to G yourself up for a game like this when we've just been subjected to that performance at Easter Road. It's You can't expect anything else than a nil in our column and a well, take your pick at a number for, for Celtic's goal tally if we produce a performance like we did in that. If, if we sit off Celtic and are as passive as we were at Easter Road, I, I agree with you, we're in trouble of producing something similar to what Dundee United did at the start of last season. Yeah, so as well, Celtic are going to be looking to make a statement themselves. It's that kind of crunch time of the season and stuff like that. Goal difference could come into play at the end as well. So... Yeah, I think they'll be looking at us being think and thinking, what a great opportunity to go and, you know, really send out a statement. And that, that's the thing. I, as much as we spoke about Hibs taking their foot off the gas, I don't imagine Celtic will show that same respect. I think they will keep their foot on the gas if they smell blood, and they will go for, as you say, looking at goal difference come the end of the season and things like that. If it does, if it is that tight. This is what gives me the big fear. Is I can't imagine Celtic showing us that almost respect, if that makes sense. Yep. Can't disagree whatsoever. <laughs> are, are we doing predictions now or do we save that closer to the time and hope that there's a, a little bit of optimism returns to us? Nah, I might as well just go with it. I can't imagine mine changing very much between now and then. When you go then? 5-0 Celtic. I'm going to go 6-0 Celtic. Wow. Remember a few seasons ago where we used to predict we could get results against them? Mind that. Do you mind those good old days? <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. As long as... Do you want to know? I'll take a positive. See if Sky Sports don't need to put the scoreline plus brackets and then have to write out the number... <laughs> can we just do what Dundee did and just get the game called off how do you waterlog a plastic pitch well we'll try it's just prolonging the inevitable isn't it let's be <laughs> honest we might as well just get it over and done with ah, it's Easter like Sunday it's Easter Sunday, Sunday most spoken of for it. like and they just give them like the points right because it's Rangers then like yeah let's just give them a 3 nil. a 3 nil would actually be quite a satisfying result if we were able to manage that but yeah as I say, look, it's Easter Sunday. Most folk, a lot of folk will be off on the Monday. You can go out. It's early enough the game that you can go out straight after it and just drown your sorrows, Livingston fans. Drown them. Drown them away and forget. Let's let's be like some of the ostriches 
that are involved in the Livingston support that think nothing is going wrong at this moment in time and don't want to believe it. We can do that and just drown our sorrows away on Easter Sunday. But, yep, I'm expecting an absolutely torrid and shite afternoon, to put it bluntly. <laughs> <laughs> That's it for this week's very depressing episode of Talk Livy. We, <laughs> we, we really appreciate you tuning in every week. and We'd love to hear your feedback. You can leave us a review on iTunes or drop us a message on Twitter, Facebook or Instagram. As you and said, we're on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram, so simply search Talk Livy to find us. You'll find all the links to our weekly episodes on there and any shares and likes are always appreciated. All our episodes are available on all the usual podcast streaming sites, including iTunes and Spotify. We're also on YouTube, and we'd love for you to subscribe to the channel. If none of those options suit you, all you have to do is head to our website, totlivypodcast.libson.com, where you'll find every single episode we've done over the last few years. That's it for this week. You'll be glad to know that is us finished depressing you for the last hour and a bit worth of content, but we do appreciate you tuning in, as always. And... Let's be honest, it'll be a much better week for the Lothian's finest football team because it's international break, so we'll be having a little break as well from talking about how bad we are at this moment in time. But yeah, thanks again for listening. Yeah.